Greetings and Happy New Year. Welcome to the Atlantic Council. My name is Bronwyn Bruton. I am the Director of Programs and Studies at the Africa Center. For most of the last year, African nations seemed insulated from the worst of the coronavirus pandemic. Africans, despite having a population of 1.3 billion people, suffered only about 4% of fatalities from the coronavirus. In recent weeks, however, the case fatality rate has surged upwards, surpassing the global average. And an alarming new variant has emerged in South Africa. This has brought renewed attention to the important question of vaccine distribution and the need to distribute it equitably. Here to discuss this important issue today is the distinguished panel of guests. Joining us once again, Dr. John Kingasong from the Africa Center for Disease Control, Professor Benedict Oroma from Afri Exam Bank, Mr. Sumaila Zuberu from the Africa Finance Corporation, and Ms. Lois Pace, who is a member of President Biden's COVID-19 Task Force. We are honored to have you all here today, and I wish to give a special thanks to the Africa Finance Corporation, who has made this convening possible through its generous support of our Afrocentury initiative. If you would like to ask a question to our wonderful panelists, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And it's my pleasure to now hand over to our very own senior fellow, Ms. Aubrey Ruby, who will be moderating our event. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Bronwyn. And it's my pleasure to be uh, walking us through this conversation today with such an esteemed panel. Uh, the timing uh, could not be more important. We know that the defining issue of 2021 will be vaccine inequality. We're seeing it domestically in the US. We just passed the 500,000 mark of deaths by COVID, and we're seeing the rollout uh, skewed towards the wealthy and white Americans. And we know that, that, that we struggle internally and domestically with uh, vaccine distribution on an equitable basis. But that same struggle is globally, and we've had in the past few weeks uh, remarks by the incoming, uh, the new head of the WTO, uh, Dr. Ngozi Okonjo Iwiela, calling for distribution of the vaccine uh, to African countries and to developing countries writ large. And we have uh, President Macron and others who have lent their voice to saying that we need a better solution to distributing the vaccines that are proving useful in, in stopping this uh, pandemic. So with that, I do want to turn to, to Dr. John Kingasan, the director of the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, who's joining us from Ethiopia. Uh, so he can give us kind of a lay of the land. What's the current situation with vaccine distribution on the continent? Uh, as Bronwyn hinted, there's been a, an uptick in uh, fatalities. Um, what's the situation with the variant of South that's found in South Africa? Really, we want to get a sense of, of what's on the, on the minds of uh, the leader of the fight in, in African market. So, uh, Dr. Kingazan, over to you. Thank you, Aubrey, for uh, inviting me once again to be, to be part of this uh, dialogue, which I, I enjoyed so much last year. So, in the spirit of this conversation today, let me... Um, divide my, my reflections into three. First of all, very briefly a touch on the epidemiological situation on the continent, just to frame the discussion. And then I will immediately go to the, 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 and this, uh, go to the topic of vaccine uh, as a whole and on, on the continent, and then conclude with some uh, remarks or reflections on where do we go from here? And with specifically uh, the question of if we do not get ourselves vaccinated, what will happen to all of us as a human species? I think so. First of all, the epidemiologic situation of, of, of COVID in Africa. As we speak today, the continent of Africa has recorded a cumulative number of about uh, 3.8 million uh, uh, people that have been infected. Uh, and of that, unfortunately, about 101,000 uh, people have died. Uh, on this continent because of that. Now, uh, there is, um, as you rightly said, in the first wave of the pandemic, uh, our case fatality rate was about 2.2%. And now we are about 2.6%. And the global average has 
decreased to 2.2%. And there are so many factors that speak to that. But it's important to underline that because it will have implications for the conversation around, around vaccines, why we need to do that quickly. Otherwise, uh, this mortality rate will continue to increase and then uh, the gap, the inequality gap will also increase. So I think that is where we are with the continent with respect to the trends. We have um, over the last four weeks observed about a 25% a steady decrease uh, in the number of, of um, uh, new cases from a very, uh, uh, the, sec the peak of a second wave, which we are recording about 34,000 daily cases around January or early February, when uh, just after the holiday seasons. And I think much of that could be at attributed to the fact that uh, the holiday seasons came in and then there was a movement of people there. So that is the background. Now, let me focus on vaccines. I think for uh, COVID vaccines, uh, I, I describe that in two dimensions. First of all, what a remarkable progress in the development of vaccines. I would never have in my 32 years career as a virologist imagined that I will see uh, a, a scenario where a new virus is identified, the sequences are known, and within one year, phase one, phase two, phase three trials are conducted, and then we start immunizing people. That is so remarkable. Uh, I say this from coming from a background of an HIV uh, uh, AIDS uh, uh, specialist over the years, where for 40 years we've not been able to, to identify a vaccine against HIV. So this is really truly remarkable uh, progress. Uh, however, we've also observed remarkable inequalities for the vaccine uh, uh, distribution and early uh, 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 uptake of these uh, uh, vaccines. And I recall that uh, when we were challenged as a human species by this virus about one year ago, everybody said the right thing. I mean, everybody, the policymakers, the politicians, and the technical experts all said the right thing. It uh, should be uh, timely access and, uh, uh, to vaccines. Uh, 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 it, it should be uh, equal distribution to vaccines. I think uh, that was those very nice words were stated, brilliantly stated and welcome. We all expressed at that time the need to have global cooperation, global solidarity to resolve a global problem, which was unprecedented in, uh, the, in our recent history. I think we only saw this scenario about 100 years ago. So I think all of those, uh, the, the right things were said, but it's really remarkable that uh, there's been what I call the value of death from translating those high level pronouncements uh, into a reality. I think we are now, uh, we have a situation or we find ourselves with a situation where we are struggling uh, to, to ask questions of how, where do we, uh, how do we get to where we are today? I think we're at the, the current status of where we are today as a continent is uh, really um, uh, regrettable uh, to say the least. A continent of 1.2 billion people have literally not started vaccinating. I think let's not fool ourselves with um, uh, pockets of vaccines that have been distributed here and there, 50,000 doses here, 200,000 uh, over there and for a continent of 1.2 billion people. You do not fight such a pandemic, or the size of the COVID-19 with such a, a, a distribution of vaccines. I think that is really uh, an area that um, speaks to the three things that we have learned, at least from our perspective, we've learned during this pandemic. One is how connected we are as a human species. Second is how vulnerable we are, whether you are from the global north or you have the global south. But very importantly, how the level of inequities that exist uh, across the world. Uh, and again, uh, speaking, uh, uh, it took us this pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, to expose all these um, the realities that we thought existed, but we just didn't know the depth of how much it, it existed there. Let me then uh, uh, speak to uh, what we are doing as a continent. Uh, these challenges have forced us to really uh, uh, be innovative and creative by using the whole of society approach, which uh, I think uh, in public health schools, we are taught uh, the lessons, when the lessons are written on how to uh, address major challenges, I, I believe that Africa will need to come to the table and some of these lessons shared. I think, first of all, is the, the power of partnerships between public health experts like myself, 
working alongside uh, people in the financial areas like Professor Benedict Orama, the private sector like uh, Strive Masiwa and, uh, and others, Ngozi uh, that you just mentioned, coming together, bringing a different uh, expertise to solve a public health problem that has a, a tremendous humanitarian component, a tremendous health security component and a tremendous economic component. That's what we have been doing in Africa. I mean, coming together almost twice a week to brainstorm on how do we solve this using the, the power of partnerships across the continent. And it is through that light that we have now established what we call the African Vaccine uh, uh, Acquisition Task Team that is working hard to make sure that we uh, acquire enough doses of vaccines to complement the 20% doses that the COVAX is pro promising the continent so that if we add those efforts, that is the COVAX uh, efforts plus the AVAC effort, we are trying to get to at least 60% of, of vaccination. I think we have to be very clear that if the continent of Africa did not vaccinate at a level of 60% plus, we will remain as a COVID continent going forward because it's very clear that Europe will be vaccinated. The United States is making good uh, 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 progress and the continent of Africa will reach, uh, become that uh, continent of COVID. I dread to see a headline in the Lancet or New, uh, New England Journal that will say COVID in Africa from a pandemic to an endemic uh, a disease. I think that will be at the moment where you, you dread this the most because uh, we are still dealing with another pandemic, HIV. We, we are struggling with tuberculosis, malaria. We are struggling with a rising uh, uh, epidemic of, of, uh, uh, of non-communicable diseases and of course, uh, antimicrobial resistance and, non, uh, and maternal childhood that we just don't want the continent of Africa to be uh, to weakness and endemicity of COVID on the continent. So that is what is going to happen if we do not vaccinate. Let me just conclude my reflections by addressing the issue of where do we go from here? Whereas we struggle to address the challenges of what I call the urgency of now, the fierce urgency of now, as Martin Luther King would characterize in 1963, we should be projecting past this current crisis and say, what do we do, okay, as a continent to guarantee our health uh, uh, security? There are three things we must do. First of all, is to embrace that we need to absolutely, as a continent, rally around and strengthen the ability of this continent to manufacture vaccines at a continental level, absolutely. You do not, and I repeat, you do not mortgage the health security of your continent to outside forces to determine that, so that uh, people who determine the, the, the fate in Geneva or the Serum Institute in India. I think that is going to be a mistake that if our political leaders do not take this message uh, seriously. This is also true for diagnostics and therape th therapeutics. The second thing is that we need to elevate our own research uh, to include centers of excellence that will go into the research and development areas. You don't just develop vaccines overnight, okay? You have to be investing in peacetime in that arena. That is why developing a centers of excellence, uh, tertiary centers of excellence will be very, very important to this effort. And lastly, a competent workforce that uh, Africa CDC will be calling on all partnerships to look at, work with us to develop the competent workforce. You, you can't have vaccines without vaccination. I think we have to bring the two together so that we have an appropriate vaccination program. So I think, um, let me conclude there for now and I look forward to a very engaging uh, conversation. Over. Thank you, Dr. Nkegazan. Um, That was a, just a tour de force of the current situation. And it's with this panel that we can address your point on partnerships. Uh, you really emphasize the importance of partnerships. And we know even in, in all the vaccine rollouts globally, it's been kind of public-private partnerships. But another important part of it is the uh, global health advocacy piece. And that's why we're so pleased to have Lois uh, join uh, this panel as well as she is the president and executive director of the Global Health Council. So we really have this whole piece of advocacy and um, the private sector. So um, I just want to turn to Lois and see Hearing what he what the doctor said, um, how do you see the role of kind of the global health advocacy uh, community in advancing this equal distribution of vaccines? Well, thanks very much, Aubrey, and thanks to the Atlantic Council for having us this morning. I, I just wanted to copy and paste everything Dr. Nkankasan said. As usual, he is 
um, a sage and um, a great leader in this space at such a critical time. Um, and so I just want to express my gratitude to him and his team um, in particular. I think that's what we try to do as advocates as well, is lift up those voices and the work um, that is happening um, on the ground day to day, just grinding, you know? Um, I mean, John does a very good job uh, tooting his own horn, I think. And yet I don't know if enough people are aware of the steady drumbeat of work and progress being made against all odds. And so I think that is our, our duty um, first and foremost is to change the narrative um, and change the mindset of folks so that they understand what the needs are um, and, and where the gaps remain, of course, um, but, we're, but what work is truly um, being done. I think also for us, it is about shifting the power in the way he said towards the end, at least that's how I interpret it. I'm not going to put words into Dr. Hinkasan's mouth, but I, I think, you know, from coming from Global Health Council, at least I can speak to the conversations we've been trying to have here in the US in particular, but even more broadly, which is this. There are, as has been said, a number of very serious priorities and a heavy disease burden on the continent already. And so we owe it to everyone, frankly, to ensure that we aren't adding more to that pile. Um, but we also owe it to everyone to learn from the experience of the past and apply those to the future. What do I mean? We have a number of initiatives that have been stood up to combat the very diseases um, that have been highlighted, right? HIV, TB, malaria, and the like. And yet, what we see today is perhaps an interest or a tendency to lift up a similar sort of Northern-led program, when in fact, these very countries, including my own, have not had the best response to COVID-19, right? We've seen strong and even stronger responses in other parts of the world. And so what could be really interesting is if we borrow, of course, from these existing mechanisms that have worked, these cooperatives like, say, COVAX, which is sort of built on that multilateral model, and yet how do we ensure that those decisions and those actions are being led by the very countries and the very regional leaders who are showing us the way today? And how do we sort of set up a model that is more of a partnership model, right? It's not so top-down or top-heavy, but one that actually lifts up and highlights the community work, civil society even, how do they get brought to the table in the COVID response in the region at the national and local levels? So that's what I think my job is as an advocate is to sort of see around those corners, look into those crevices and understand where we could go from here. Again, it's not to say that it was all broken um, to begin with and yet here we are, right? We know that everything we were doing um, wasn't working entirely or else our health systems and those mechanisms would have been more resilient to withstand this great shock. And so my goal is to ensure we've truly rebuilt that in a way that it can endure the next outbreak or pandemic, God forbid we have another. Yeah, so I'm glad you brought up the health systems piece and the infrastructure that surrounds uh, health because I really wanna to turn to uh, Samila to talk about the African Finance Corporation's investment in health infrastructure. Um, because you need the infrastructure around um, the delivery of vaccines in addition. So I know that you guys have been investing in um, some building of infrastructure a bit large, but also when you're involved in health infrastructure and how you see that the AFC is playing a role in this effort to vaccinate more Africans. Sabila, you're on mute. Yeah, thank you for having me on this uh, panel. Uh, I'll just follow through with um, the comments that have been made. So we know that um, Africa has uh, had a challenge overcoming the pandemic. Um, we think that um, part of the challenge we have is our inadequate health care facilities, which is why one of the first things we did was to try to see how we could uh, build some emergency health care facilities in Lagos and in Abuja, and we're providing support to um, uh, the countries in which we operate through our Arise Integrated Industrial Platform. But we've always seen this uh, pandemic as an opportunity for Africa to really take ownership of its healthcare facility uh, delivery system, particularly um, the fact that we don't have manufacturing capacity on the continent. Um, we have an initiative that we started last year. We are trying to build a um, pharmaceutical city, uh, focusing on production of APIs, we are talking to a few anchors 
that would um, provide the base. And then we're looking at other people that can build on top of that to provide you know, most of the therapeutics that are required, as well as the production of the PPE and other things that we need. Through our sovereign lending program, we support African states you know, uh, to build their healthcare systems. We have advanced, I think, additional loans of about uh, 600 million uh, in the last year to support uh, this uh, initiative. Uh, we also have our transport and logistics um, team that is focusing on initiatives around cold chains, uh, around better access uh, in the ports. You know, so within the ports, the ports were mainly built for, I would say, trading commodities, you know, yeah. uh, and importing, uh, importing finished goods. So we're trying to see that we can have the infrastructure, you know, for cold chains, and that will support distribution of vaccines. Uh, we're also working with uh, Afrexin uh, on the AVAT uh, scheme that they've initiated together with other uh, um, parties. And we're seeing how we can support that uh, initiative as well. Thank you, Smila. Uh, and we've really, really teed up uh, Professor Benedict Roma from joining us from Cairo uh, to talk about what AfriXM is doing to help um, uh, procure, help African countries procure uh, vaccines and the guarantees that it has put up. So welcome, Professor. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Audrey, and uh, thanks to um, uh, my colleagues on this uh, panel uh, for uh, their very insightful comments. Um, I think um, the stage has been set by, by my, the previous speakers. Uh, for Africa, uh, what we faced um, as the year ended last year was a situation um, uh, that no African or uh, nobody would like to see happen on the continent. Uh, it could be obvious to us uh, that we will be seeing countries vaccinate their own people while Africans look on as spectators. Um, uh, John uh, will tell you uh, that uh, the nightmare he will, uh, always reminded us of, it was the nightmare of the HIV, uh, the therapeutics that took seven years to come to Africa. And it, uh, between that period for the discovery and use in other parts of the world, and when he came to Africa, 12 million people died. So uh, based on the initiative of the African Union and on the recommendation of Africa CDC, the um, Africa Vaccine Acquisition Task Team, the AVAT, was created. And we were tasked to uh, do three key things. Uh, go and find vaccines. Uh, don't forget, it was a very, very tight market. It was a kind of survival of the fittest. Um, make sure you, uh, you do that. Uh, find the vaccines for the continent on a whole of Africa approach. Food procurement to make sure that the smallest economies, the island economies are not disadvantaged, as all countries got fair and equitable access. Uh, the second thing was look, uh, estimate the funding cost, and also let us uh, arrange, help us to arrange the financing. So what we then went on to do was to do the negotiation. That was the, the, the most difficult part, as you can imagine, uh, because Although many countries, 192 countries, came together under the COVAX facility, um, as soon as uh, the COVAX facility was done and COVAX was supposed to be leading, many countries went on and did bilateral deals. Um, so there were no manufacturing capacities. So, but um, thanks to uh, the work and initiatives of the leadership of the African Union, uh, by January, this advert, we have, I was able to um, to receive offers, provisional offers for 270 million doses of vaccines. Um, the 270 million doses uh, were estimated to cost about $1.86 billion. Um, again, um, I would like some of money, uh, but for the continent, uh, they said never again, we're not gonna just rely on donors. Uh, we have to do it ourselves because for us, unless we sort out the, economy, the, the, the virus, our economies will not be sorted out. Um, and as uh, uh, John mentioned, um, if we didn't vaccinate enough people, 
uh, we would then be a continent of COVID, where others will have moved on and the development divide will widen. So the, the, the AU, the, all the countries agreed that we had to find the money to fund this. Uh, so our Fresen Bank was mandated to arrange the funding um, uh, and uh, we uh, got our board approval. And of course, they're talking to our partners like AFC, uh, as Samala mentioned, uh, and um, others like Trade and Development Bank and so on, the Arab Bank for Economic Development in Africa. We, we started talking to them uh, to come together uh, so that we can do more than the $2 billion required because the, uh, the two billion dollars can only buy 15% of the requirements. We have the journey towards the 60% John, uh, John mentioned. Covers will be 20%. So we want to make sure that we'll go beyond the two billion. Uh, and we're also happy that we are beginning to get the interest and support of our other uh, regular partners. But more importantly, we wanted to focus and do this as, uh, as Africans in a cool way. And uh, we are pleased Professor, were you able to, you know, we've heard a lot about the issues around the fiscal space and the, the debt relief uh, that's been needed to free up fiscal space for African governments to, to, you know, combat COVID. And in this way, you're taking that fiscal space question even further by creating further guarantees for the countries to be able to access the vaccines. And as you said, that's a small part of it. Where do you see the future going for this uh, guarantee scheme? Do you see it expanding dramatically or other uh, foreign sources of capital coming in to match it? Uh, yes, what, what we've done, as I said, uh, the, the two billion was for 15%. But what we think we need to, 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 to be able to get to where we want is more than about 3.5 3, 3, 3, 3 billion. You are right. We wanted to make sure we arrange financing that would uh, uh, make it easier from a fiscal point of view for the countries. So the countries will have about five years to pay uh, for, for this and uh, at the pricing of the loan that, or the facility that will be easier for them. But another thing we've done uh, to make it even easier for our countries is we have what we call the private sector window of the advanced procurement commitment. Uh, because we found that the private sector was very enthusiastic in coming to support the countries. Um, and unless we, we, we were innovative of a way to bring them in, we wouldn't get enough money. Or even if we got the countries to take on this, we will only be compounding their fiscal situation. So the, the, the first participant under this arrangement is the MTN South Africa, who have donated $25 million. I'm aware also that the COVID, the coalition for, uh, for COVID in Nigeria, are putting hundred million dollars. This wouldn't have been possible without this uh, the private sector window we've created. We expect that uh, these uh, complements plus uh, the indications we are beginning to get from our usual partners will help us. Uh, I'm happy that um, Ms. Pace is here uh, and uh, we're hoping that the US and Europe and so on will also support this initiative um, because we've taken the lead as Africans. Um, uh, we need that they come along, uh, come along maybe to help us expand uh, the capacity to support it as a complement to what the COVAX is doing, but also to make it possible for countries uh, to be able to access this without jeopardizing their fiscal situation. Thank you, Dr. Or thank you, Professor Arama. I want to come back to Dr. Nkikasan because uh, the question around uh, kind of the phaseology of this. Obviously, securing global supplies for African distribution is kind of this first wave, but uh, you had mentioned many times the production capacity for vaccines on the continent. What does that look like today, and where can entities like AFC be investing? We know that, for example, South Africa is home to Aspen Pharmaceuticals, which is you know one of the largest generic producers in the world, um, but how do you see the kind of uh, the landscape for eventual production on, on the continent? I, I think I'm very um, optimistic, given what uh, the landscape uh, uh, surveys that we've done. And uh, you started with South Africa. I think in South Africa alone, we have about two potential uh, manufacturers, uh, the Aspen and the Biotech. And then uh, in Senegal, you know, they are already doing uh, yellow fever vaccines. And I think uh, very, uh, if we can 
uh, in the spirit of uh, and truly an emergency and being very deliberate to e equilibrate uh, the, uh, and balance uh, our uh, health security architecture. If we were to say in the spirit of true partnerships to inject 100 million into Senegal or even less, I mean, by the end of the year, you'll be able to be uh, doing vaccines, producing vaccines there that will help this pandemic. I think that is that. Then you go up to Egypt where Professor Rama is. I think there's uh, the virus cell out, out there is uh, very capable of producing uh, vaccines then. So I'll call those the first level of, of uh, um, the sites that can produce uh, vaccines on the continent. Then you, the second layer of, of these countries are those that are already producing some types of vaccines like rabies vaccines, Ethiopia, Nigeria, and, and others are come in that category there. So the, 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 the general tendency was, uh, what I call the, the very high level statements that are usually made, like we don't have the capacity on the continent is, is false. But we have to really look at this pandemic in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a, take it, see it in, 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 in its entirety and say, if we do not do this, what will happen to, to, for, for all of us to get out of this? I think that is a fundamental question we, we have in front of us. I mean, not a question of where we will just keep doing what we are doing and get some vaccines to cover, but really face it, the enormity of this pandemic and say, and we don't know even these vaccines that we are administering, if, they will be effective for one year only for two years or going forward there. So it is for our collective interest to really diversify our uh, health security apparatus by investing into in this uh, land, the, the structures that already exist on the continent that can quickly uh, uh, be uh, repurposed to producing these COVID vaccines that we need. And, and Samila, are you looking to invest in uh, production facilities? Have you done a landscape and, and seen some interesting opportunities on that front? Certainly, you know, our heavy industries uh, platform or vertical is based on import substitution. And um, we've identified uh, the need for production capacity on the continent as uh, uh, a key priority for us. So what we're doing is that we're working with existing uh, producers to see how we can augment their capacity. And we're also looking at new initiatives of a skill that we think is required to be ready you know, for future challenges. Because as far as we're concerned, before COVID, uh, Africa was uh, importing about 21, 22% of the vaccines produced globally, mainly from um, India, Europe, uh, China. Uh, and um, with all the challenges that we have on the fiscal front, we're trying to see how we can do import substitution programs. So we would continue to uh, drive that initiative, uh, start starting with companies or countries where we have existing capacity, and then looking at countries that have uh, the potential, you know, for additional capacity, and working with all of them. So are that's the that's the strategy for us. Are there any lessons to be learned from the uh, PPE case? Because remember, at the beginning of the pandemic, there was kind of a scramble for PPE, and then looking for opportunities to manufacture that locally. Um, so has there been lessons learned on that front? Certainly, you know, um, so since that, uh, um, at that event, we've seen increased uh, capacity or increased willingness, I would say, and also support from governments, you know, to uh, provide the incentives that are required. So for example, I know that in, in Nigeria, uh, the central bank gave uh, fiscal allowance, you know, um, gave uh, more concessionary returns for pharmaceutical companies. Uh, put aside a large amount of funding um, with longer tenor, cheaper pricing to support pharmaceuticals. Um, so we have those initiatives um, ongoing in, on the continent. You know, I think what is important now is to really uh, take a bolder step to look at how can we create an industrial pack or an industrial value chain that will focus on the API that's required and then how can we incentivize other players to come around and see how they can feed on that. Um, we do that by trying to ensure that we take charge of all the infrastructure bottlenecks that they typically would have. Um, we ensure that we have the licensing and permitting that's required for them to operate seamlessly. And then um, they would have the, the opportunity, especially because we know doing that, you know, would save the scarce foreign exchange that they don't have. We will create jobs on the continent and it will move Africa from just being a producer of basic um, implements to value 
are creative uh, producers. So we, we think that um, the lesson learned here is that we should continue to do the things that we're doing. We should focus on specific outcomes and work with all the relevant parties to ensure that we achieve them. We have an initiative that we're working on with together with uh, Afrexim in relation to the vaccine production, together with also our Arise Integrated Industrial Platform. We have these two initiatives. And I think between those two, we should be able to um, achieve some out outcomes before the end of the year. Great. I wanted to shift the conversation to uh, vaccine diplomacy. I started by saying that vaccine inequality will define 2021 and vaccine diplomacy and debating about global supplies and how uh, big players like China, US, Russia fit into this uh, distribution globally uh, is going to be a big question, especially in a year when we have the Chinese Forum uh, for African Cooperation coming up, FOCAC to hear what the Chinese are thinking around um, of supporting African countries. And the Russians I hear have also offered uh, vaccines. So I'd love to hear from uh, Professor Roma and uh, Dr. Nkigas on, on how you engage with these different parties. Have, um, have the, has the Africa CDC signed deals with Pfizer and AstraZeneca already? Are you, you know, taking on supplies from Russia? How do you see the, the global landscape for accessing uh, the vaccine. So first I'll turn to Professor Aroma and how uh, AFRI-EXIM is negotiating and then we'll hear from uh, Dr. Nkengazan. Dr. Aroma, are you still with us? Professor? Yes, I'm here. Okay, excellent. Are you, are you seeing me? Yes, excellent, we do. All right, thank you. So as I was saying, I said that maybe John and I will be answering the same, saying the same things uh, since we are members of AVAT. Uh, I think the, the principle we have at AVAT is that uh, we talk to all uh, uh, credible candidate vaccine manufacturers. Our goal is to bring vaccines into the continent as quickly as possible, as efficiently as possible, as cheaply as possible. Uh, and that means that we have to talk to everybody. Um, so we uh, currently the vaccines we have in the pool are three. Uh, they are the um, uh, Pfizer vaccines, the AstraZeneca, and uh, Johnson and Johnson. Uh, we are uh, now finalizing our discussions with uh, uh, the Russian Sputnik uh, for uh, to enter an agreement with them, also. And I think uh, we also beginning also to discuss with the Chinese. Uh, uh, there have been also discussion with others, like the manufacturer, the, the Novavax vaccine that hopefully will be licensed uh, sometime in the future. So we will talk. We'll be talking to every everybody. Um, uh, the African Medical Supplies Platform, which you know, the the, the digital platform that uh, we are implementing under the auspices of the Africa CDC, that's what we are using to distribute this. So any vaccine we negotiate. And, and uh, we reach an agreement with based on the principles of, uh, of the negotiations we have, who we'll go up on the platform. And countries are free to, uh, uh, to um, request to buy them. Uh, if they pre-order them, then they will then have access to the financing that we put in place to support those procurements. And are you still on track for uh, delivering the first doses in March? Because that was reported at some point. I think um, I don't want to speak about it, but I think we will be del delivering some small doses from uh, um, all things being equal for next week. Uh, this will be small doses, and then um, towards the end of March, and then into April, we will see, start seeing hopefully scale ups. We will have uh, then um, uh, probably then have signed all the agreements, completed the negotiations of the indemnities, and so on. So at, at, the, at the first uh, small deliveries, hopefully we start going for next week. And uh, Dr. Nkigason, I'll let you comment on the landscape of vaccine diplomacy. I mean, there's been a lot of press on how, you know, the, Canada has gotten more vaccines and secured more vaccines to, you know, vaccinate their population twice over. The U.S. is trying to secure, over-secure. Um, you know, how do we negotiate in, in that environment where countries are uh, trying to cover their population with it, with a um, degree of oversubscription, if you will. So, thank you. Let me uh, reflect on this this way. That first of all, uh, let, me, let me offer a framework of thinking through this. Is 
that the issue that we have in front of us is huge as a continent. This is, uh, uh, we're dealing with a threat that is going to determine our own survival as a continent and our own, uh, uh, to an extent, not knowing the future. There's, there's always a saying that you can never predict the future. We don't know what the future of this pandemic will go, look like in Africa. So it becomes a, 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 an existential issue there. So from those two perspectives there, I think, um, uh, we should be very, uh, uh, we'll caution that we use the word diplomacy carefully, that um, it is not used uh, as if it's a game that uh, uh, some powers are playing with Africa, where we are dealing with issue of survival and existentialism there. I think that is very, very, it will be very troubling then. If you, we put that literally, that uh, diplomacy is managing relationships here and there, then Africa will refuse to be that playing ground where we, we use COVID as an, a, a tool to, to manage relationships there. Now, the issues are serious. They, we're dealing with human life on the continent. If one year ago, I would, someone would have said to me as a public health expert that 100,000 Africans are going to die within one year, I would not be thinking of diplomacy. I'll be thinking of how do we save 100,000 lives on, on the continent. And that is true for the whole world. If one year ago someone would, would have said that 2.2 million people would die because of COVID, you and I would not be talking of diplomacy. We're talking of how do we stop it and not normalize the situation. My fear with the, the whole talk of vaccine diplomacy is that we begin to make it look like this is some a game that we are playing uh, yeah. to win favors here and there, which absolutely should not be the case there. We should be serious about this. We should know that this is life's loss and we cannot normalize uh, the, the deaths in this in this pandemic. That is That will be regrettable if that is the sense uh, I'm hearing the, the, the vaccine diplomacy uh, being used uh, uh, to in, in this very difficult situation. Especially if it assumes that African countries are the pawns in this game of global competition for influence. That's exactly the where we just go there. We, we sprinkle uh, 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 50,000 doses of vaccines here, 100,000 there. Then it becomes like uh, you're trying to uh, uh, sprinkle water in a very hot day on children so that they can get get a little bit of relief from the sun and then you can uh, uh, tick the box that you did that. That's not what we are after as a continent. We are serious about saving our people. That's all I would say on this matter. Now, I want to bring in Lois to this question because, you know, obviously the fight against COVID in the U.S. is, is a major priority of this new administration. Um, but how do we continue to keep the global distribution of vaccines on the agenda when the domestic case seems so urgent? So how does the global advocacy community think about that when, when talking about uh, a situation where there is no line between the domestic and the international anymore? Okay. Well, I think John's right. It's, it doesn't need to be an either or, and it can't be, right? We are all in this together, truly. Um, and if we haven't figured that out by now, after a year, then we're not paying attention. Um, I've been talking about how we, and I think others have shared this mantra, right? How we go from a scarcity mindset to a one of solidarity, to one where we really truly look at our common ground and understand that our fate is intertwined with each other, right? And it's, and I really uh, appreciate um, the comments Dr. Kankasan just made about, about diplomacy and the dangers of using that word. Now, if there is some way we can um, leverage those vehicles, right, to do right by others, then fine. Um, but surely let's be careful limiting ourselves um, to this idea that this is, um, you know, some sort of quid pro quo, for example, um, in, in this space. We, we, we don't have the luxury of operating in that way, and it would be quite irresponsible um, to do so. Now, that said, I'm really happy that my government has stepped up. And speaking of lessons learned and recent changes, right, I think that seeing the Biden administration come out and make a pledge to the COVAX facility and put money on the table, um, that's absolutely required to at least meet that need. Um, and that call to action is really important. And, and I'm hopeful um, that our government will follow through um, with additional actions and commitments. I think having a seat at the table and being ready to stand shoulder to shoulder with other leaders around the world is, is sort of a, a first step. Right, and something that our advocacy community has been calling for. But beyond that, we have to also just think about, um, for example, you know, the other ways that we 
that we are working together and making progress collectively, right? We can't be at different phases of this situation and have the US, for example, be way out front. Now, in this case, we are not way out front, um, I, I can say, given our situation, but I think that helps us make the case to even our people to say, do you know how it feels for our hospitals to be overrun, for our health workers to be overwhelmed? That's exactly what's happening in other parts of the world. And we would do right and better by one another if we could draw that thread between what we're facing here um, in our urban cities or rural areas and what's also being mimicked or replicated, unfortunately, on the continent of Africa. So what about that? You know, let's meet that call to action. Let's let's fulfill that pledge to vaccinate health workers worldwide, to vaccinate our elderly worldwide, to ensure that we are able to celebrate those gains simultaneously. Because I, I know that, you know, as, as much as I'm seeking relief here at home, you know, for, for my, we talked about, we talk about our people, it's black and black and brown people are, are suffering here too, right? And as much as I want to celebrate that as we make progress, I can't do that if I know that other black and brown and indigenous folk around the world are not being, being serviced, you know, are not, being addressed or not, their needs are not being met in other parts. And so that's that's my goal personally. And I think that's our goal as advocates to, to ensure that we are truly mindful of, of how much we really are in this together. Yeah, and I think global advocacy is more effective when you have very strong counterparts um, like uh, Africa CDC, like AFRI-XM and AFC. Um, you know, one of the things that I've seen is it seems to me a strengthening of Pan-African institutions. Um, in this effort to combat a truly transnational issue, which is the pandemic. Um, I'd love to hear from uh, Dr. Nkingas on, on how you think um, the lessons learned of coordination can be embedded and institutionalized across AU structures. I mean, we know the African Union has existed for a long time, but many people have said that parts of it have been undercapacitated. You know, can this effort show what Pan-African institutions can do and how can we think about that as the African Continental Free Trade Agreement is just getting off the ground, the Secretariat is just starting, how can we strengthen Pan-African institutions to do collective you know, bargaining in a way, collective procurement? It's not just in the case of vaccines that that, that would be effective. Are there any lessons that can be learned? I mean, absolutely. I, I, I think it, it has to be a, a new NOMA for the continent that uh, your own institutions uh, uh, that were created uh, out of the, the wisdom and vision of uh, head of states uh, actually supported and, and, and empowered, not just uh, 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 giving a, 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 a check here and there, but really empowering them. I, I, the, the African Union is, uh, has gone through a transition. I mean, from the organization of African unity where the whole sole purpose at that time in its creation in 1963 was to achieve African countries to gain independence. Now we are in a different era that uh, in the 21st century where we have to make uh, uh, um, the, the, the organization and its affiliated institutions like Africa CDC be more impactful to the citizens of the continent. Okay, without that, uh, I mean, we have, uh, uh, it, you become irrelevant because, I mean, the, the population will begin to ask the question, what are you out there, what are you doing? Remember that we have been through a, a generational issue, the people of our age that were born around independence understood what the Julius Nyerere's, the Kwame Nkrumah's, the Helle Selesis were all fighting about. Uh, our own children are beginning to uh, be, be, be told that that was history, that there were some people that fought for those, such independence. So we have to make this African institution be relevant to them. The, the, the Afri Exim Banks, the, the Africa uh, um, uh, 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 CDC be, be more relevant to the country so that when you go to a member state and you say, what is Africa CDC doing? It should be as easy as asking them, what does Google do for you? I mean, they'll tell you that I go to Google there and I see it's a search engine. I mean, it should be very, very clear that without even giving a lecture there in an, amphi, in a, in an amphitheater in Lagos or Cameroon, it should be very obvious then. So unless we do that, I think our continent's future is not, it will be compromised. I think, but we need partnerships. We need really trusted partnerships. Partnerships that come in and align with a vision that 
we uh, are map out for ourselves. It's not lack of ideas or vision. It's really how do we translate those visions into uh, actions uh, and partnerships with um, uh, the lawyers, the kind of advocacy that you're preaching uh, out there and engaging out there. And, uh, and then in intercontinental coordination, working with uh, someone like uh, Prof. Benedict Rama and others have been the greatest, one of the greatest uh, uh, highlights of this pandemic for me fighting the pandemic. Otherwise, uh, the, we would have been working in silos, trying to develop surveillance systems in countries and then not looking at the whole picture. But now, believe me, you going forward, I will be arguing for a stronger partnership with African institutions like theirs, the African Development Bank and, the, the, and others so that we can resolve the issues. Now, your point on making these institutions relevant to the youth is very, very important, um, that they becomes part and they understand what they serve and how they serve. And even people like you having a very uh, public profile, I think, is helpful for that effort. And as we see more Africans taking leadership positions like Ngozi Konjowela at the WTO, like Mokhtar Diop at IFC, uh, you'll have more of that uh, experience for young people, I think. Uh, Dr. Uh, Thank you so much for your, your views on this. I want to turn to Professor Benedicta Roma, see your view on, on any of the Pan-African institutions, but also there were several questions for you in our chat, and we'd like to be responsive to our audience about the interest rates that countries pay to be part of the guarantee scheme uh, to, to purchase the vaccines. So I'll go to, to Professor. Uh, no, thank you very much. Let me talk about the uh, Pan-African institutions. Um, if you um, if you look at what we've done since the pandemic setting, the creation of the African Medical Supply Platform, the food procurement for therapeutics, PPE, and so on. If anybody doubted the value of African institutions, that would tell the person that that doubt should be laid to rest. Uh, we have um, a continent with a colonial history that divided us into 55 atomistic countries. Not uh, just a few of them, maybe a handful could go and negotiate anything with anybody, uh, even the vaccine negotiations. If you allow the country to go on their own, they will never get any vaccines on the table. Uh, and I tell you, and I just can confirm to you, it was when we formed the AVAT, the African Institution, uh, Africa CDC on the technical, clinical uh, level, sitting there, um, of course, our ministers, at our present bank saying, we, uh, look, we are negotiating. We are not asking you for donation. We, we, we need, as long as your vaccination is effective and Africa CDC says it's good, and we reach a good decision, a conclusion on the, on the indemnities and pricing, we will pay for it. The discussions change. People talk to us seriously. Uh, so that is why we need to really strengthen uh, our institution. The FCM Secretary is another thing. I come to the price. I think these are, are things we do uh, privately. Uh, when we want to announce the price, I think we will leave it uh, to the appropriate authorities at the African Union because this we are doing it uh, essentially not like the, the commercial transactions we do. Uh, the pricing uh, is uniform all across, so that everybody uh, is uh, pays the same thing. Um, so I, I will not jump the gun. I will let the the African Union do the announcement at appropriate time. Yeah. And so thank you for mentioning the, the fragmentation that Africa has faced since uh, colonial times. And I think that the, the institutions that you're, you know, that we're standing up now around the African Continental Free Trade Agreement can help to address some of these things and create larger markets and larger entities. You think, are there lessons to be learned about um, through the COVID experience that we can apply to the rollout of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement in your view, Professor? Oh, no, what he does is just validates the, the, um, uh, 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 the AFCFTA um, uh, that have been created. Uh, because what he, what he, do, what he has done uh, is that <clears throat> it tells us the value we bring when we are together. Uh, but beyond that, um, uh, I think uh, uh, Samaila has been talking about what we do about creating static capacities within the continent. Unless we create regional uh, uh, value chains, uh, we are not going to be able to create that capacity quickly, uh, especially in the context of the fact that we already have 
uh, incumbent producers of some of these things. So the AFCFTA gives us that opportunity. And uh, coming together as we've done under the COVID-19, uh, pulling our procurements, pulling our finances together, gives me the, um, uh, the confidence that the uh, AFCFTA will be successful and that the goals will be met. Uh, and that goal uh, will be one that I believe that every African uh, will be proud of. Because unless we do that, unless we have the AFCFTA achieve what it was set up to do, the continent will continue to regress. It will not make progress. Thank you, Professor. And I want to turn to Samila for a quick question to him, which is about how do how does AFC think about de-risking investment in a productive supply chain around pharmaceuticals? So what are the kind of public partnerships that could be developed with the government of Nigeria, AFC, and maybe a uh, Indian entity or an outside entity. Can you give an example? Good. Yes, thank you. But well, very quickly, I would like to, um, I would uh, suggest to uh, Ms. Lois Space um, uh, uh, that we should engage on how we can get more support for this uh, initiative that we have for vaccine procurement. So one of the ways that um, the Global Advocacy Group could help and with where she is, is to help us with uh, guarantees. You know, um, so uh, somebody uh, talked about pricing, uh, the facilities that we're trying to put in place, at uh, what price will it be? So I think if we have a, a program around guarantees, it will help reduce the price, you know, uh, because, you know, funding, you know, has a cost, you know, um, irrespective of, uh, and then Africa, we have, a, I would say, a premium, uh, higher premium, we pay much higher than any other person uh, for financing. So if we can have a framework whereby we can have a guarantee program that makes the price equate to what is normal in other parts of the world. We would see that translate into the price of the facilities we, we provide and better access to the vaccine. So maybe Bronwyn, uh, Audrey, if you can facilitate the conversation, we'll be glad to see how we can uh, do something in that space. And then very quickly on the de-risking, you know, for us, what is important is to ensure that we have the elements for success and viability uh, identified upfront. And we take ownership, uh, working with the partners, working with governments to ensure that uh, we address those. That way, um, whoever is coming in uh, to do the pharmaceutical production has less to contend with. What we try to do is try to um, identify upfront all the key risks, allocate those risks to the best person to take care of them. Sometimes it is, we would have to take charge of those risks. Sometimes it's the government. And then uh, we won't do that risk allocation, and then we will de risk the opportunity. Uh, I think the, listen, the reason why we have these events is that we meet people like Lois and we make the connections. So we're happy to, to play that role. Um, and, you know, I think the de risking piece is there's a role for all these parties to play in that process. Not to mention just the communicating of the opportunity to the global market. Really, that's why the Atlantic Council, we do these events have broad reach so that we can hear about investors that would be interested or other partners, whether they be from the philanthropic space or from the uh, investor side of things. So I really think that's a great place to end because we really started with uh, Dr. King is on talking about um, partnerships and the importance of partnerships in the fight against COVID and the rollout of vaccines. So I really wanna thank you for joining today and I'm gonna turn back over to Bronwyn so that she can uh, close us out. Thank you so much, Aubrey, for your wonderful moderation of that conversation. Thank you so much to our esteemed panel, Dr. Kengasong, Professor Oroma, Mr. Samana Zuberu, Ms. Lloyd's Pace. This conversation was tremendous. Um, I'm sorry that we didn't uh, reach the issue of vaccine hesitancy. We didn't have a chance to talk too much about intellectual property rights. So perhaps we'll drag you all back for another conversation in the near future. And um, Samila, thank you so much for your request, we would be so happy to continue facilitating conversations around this topic. Um, I wish you all a wonderful new year, a more prosperous, bright, and happier new year than the one that we had last year. Thank you all so much for joining us, and we'll see you again soon. Many thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.